How to Fix Your Gut, Optimizing Gut Health by Addressing Lifestyle First by Dave Mayo. The purpose of this video is to help you, the individual, improve your gut health by identifying problems that you have, addressing them, and seeing how your body responds. Now, this may come to you as a person with a functional gastrointestinal disorder who wants to try a few things before you see a practitioner, or you could simply be somebody who is in healthy condition, no major gastrointestinal problems, who simply want to streamline your gastrointestinal tract either to uh, improve health span or longevity. However you go about this, whichever group you're in, uh, this video is for you. So the first step in the process is to perform a nine point gut scan. And what we're going to do here is we're going to identify nine different points within the gastrointestinal tract where we can see symptoms or problems that creep up that may indicate that something's happening or something's wrong. We'll also discuss systemic problems that you need to address, um, things such as inflammation or um, other factors uh, that kind of relate to your gut health. Then we'll discuss testing that matters. We're gonna to first touch upon things that you would get in your annual physical from a comprehensive metabolic panel. And then we'll briefly identify some tests that if you move on to the practitioner stage or you feel comfortable uh, with analyzing yourself that you can look into to improve your gut health. And then finally, we will discuss behavioral factors that you can change or look at to kind of pinpoint where some of your problems might be coming from. For example, if you have a lot of problems um, with your motility, there are certain things you can do um, to address that, SIBO, things of that nature. Probably the most important thing you can do that absolutely nobody ever does is perform a nine point GI scan. You're going to scan your entire gastrointestinal tract for problems that you may or may, may not know are even a problem for you. And we're going to see what these symptoms are. Now, this step is crucial to getting a, a good read on what your gastrointestinal problem is um, or what your weak points are if you don't have gastrointestinal problems. People ignore this step and in fact it's almost essentially um, it's essentially worthless to do an elimination diet if you have not assessed your entire gastrointestinal tract as well as symptoms that may um, that may creep up that you should be on the lookout for when you reintroduce foods. So the first step in the scan, we want to assess the entire GI tract. This will give us tons of insight. Uh, the reasoning behind this is that digestion is a progressive process. Each step relies on the previous. For example, inside our mouth, chewing does a bunch of things. It doesn't just mechanically break down our food. It initiates the digestive process. Chewing increases saliva. Uh, there are a number of things in saliva that a, such as salivary amylase helps break down um, carbohydrate, but there's also something called lysozyme, which should help begin shredding bacteria that's within our mouth. This prepares food down into the stomach where uh, protein breakdown continues both mechanically and chemically. Stomach is the primary site of uh, major protein breakdown into smaller um, peptides that can eventually get into the small intestine. Small intestine Nutrient absorption occurs there. Uh, motility is a requirement. Colon kind of holds the um, the food bolus until it um, you know gets sent out the back door. And then we have digestive accessory organs such as the liver, gallbladder, bladder, and pancreas. And we want to assess the functions of these organs as well. We want to look at the entire thing. We want to identify symptoms we may have that we're really not focusing on, um, or things that we may not know are problems because they don't elicit crazy symptoms, um, but they may be underlying issues such as you may not know your oral uh, microbiome is a problem, but that oral microbiome could actually um, help uh, promote uh, inflammatory bowel diseases such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Uh, that's really key here. Problems in one area often pop up elsewhere, especially the oral cavity. Um, the bacteria that grow in your mouth go through your entire digestive tract if you don't um, if you don't break them down uh, in the stomach, stomach, if you don't kill them, uh, if bile uh, acids don't kind of, you know, uh, emulsify their membranes, if none of that stuff happens, you can have bacteria translocate from your mouth into basically anywhere else in your digestive tract, and that's not necessarily a good thing. 
multiple problems. Uh, so if you have a problem with your oral health, you notice you have a problem in your stomach health. Uh, multiple problems generally identify deeper problems, and there's almost uh, certainly some sort of systemic um, issue contributing to the problem, such as diabetes or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And as I mentioned, not everybody does this, but this is a crucial step in gut healing. Uh, it's certainly something you should do if you are even considering doing an elimination diet. A lot of people don't think about this at all. They simply say, I'm going to go low, low FODMAP, or I'm going to do AIP, or I'm just going to go carnivore and eliminate essentially everything out of your diet. The problem is most diets don't work long term. After two years, people get bored with them and they end up going back to their other diet. So you can spend, you know, six months, six to 12 months eating nothing but meat, or you can spend, you know, a few months identifying the foods that are right for you that work well with your digestive tract and make you feel good. And then just center your diet around those foods and kind of dabble uh, with foods that may not be so great only occasionally. So we're going to begin in the mouth and upper esophagus um, simply because t you can have uh, bacteria kind of translocate more easily from the mouth into the upper esophagus. Um, we're talking about general oral health. Do you have a history of cavities or abscesses or things of that nature? Bad breath is, is a pretty uh, good signal that your uh, oral health is not great. Gingivitis and other periodontal disease, which clearly contribute to bad breath as well bone erosion or a root canal. Now, I know a lot of people think, oh, you got a root canal. Well, a lot of people think that root canals are, you know, bad for health or whatever, but I'm more concerned with why the root canal happened. If you had a root canal because you had trauma to your uh, teeth, you, you broke a tooth and you had it replaced, I'm less concerned about having that root canal than having had a root canal because you have poor oral health. It's going to indicate that your oral microbiome is probably pretty bad. Canker sores or aphthous ulcers are another thing to look out for. They, um, uh, they're common. Certain foods can trigger them. That does not necessarily mean you are intolerant to the food. It just means you're sensitive to the food. For example, uh, people who get these ulcers often tend to eat more acidic things than people who don't. But it can also indicate that you're having uh, problems further down the gastrointestinal tract if you are forming some form of an immune response to the um, uh, to some foods. Uh, the burning on the roof of the mouth, which is a common thing, it's kind of unexplained, but it can indicate that there is an imbalance in the oral microbiome and may also indicate problems further down. Thrush, oral thrush, uh, thrush in your throat. Um, this is simply candida from your mouth um, converting into the fungal form and becoming pathogenic. It can cause problems. Uh, this can indicate you know, uh, problems with your diet, um, you know, and uh, poor oral health in general. It can also indicate that the immune system in your mouth is not working properly because it normally suppresses uh, the conversion from yeast to fungus from candida. Recurrent strep throat, uh, strep throat, streptococcus is coming from your um, uh, mouth. Uh, so when it kind of uh, overgrows um, in your throat, that can be an indication of poor or oral health. It can also be an identification of uh, immunocompromisation, things of that nature. So um, looking at the, your oral health, uh, your mouth, your upper esophagus can give us insights into your oral microbiome, your oral health, and your diet overall. It can also give us an idea into meal patterns um, simply because um, if you're grazing all day long and not brushing your teeth, you're going to have a problem with bacteria in your oral microbiome versus if you eat, you know, two or three meals a day and you always brush afterwards. Why oral health matters. So oral health matters because the bacteria that's in your mouth is going to be exposed to your entire digestive tract. Better for them to be um, uh, commensals uh, that have not overgrown and preferably dead once they leave the stomach. But there are many opportunistic pathogens in the um, oral cavity. For example, Canida albicans. Uh, there was an interesting paper, which I've linked to uh, a blog that I did on the article in this presentation. It found that people who practice good oral health by brushing with a fluoride toothpaste three times a day had 10 to 100 times lower exposure of Candida albicans through their digestive tract, meaning less Candida albicans came out in their feces uh, simply because they were regularly removing it from their mouth. Another uh, pretty, uh, pretty important um, factor to look at with oral health is that in uh, IBD, there is a lot of oral bacteria found in uh, the um, 
in the uh, gastrointestinal tract, specifically small intestine or the, the colon. And normally these are actually normal bacteria to have in your mouth. They're not bad, but if they get into your uh, colon, they can cause ulcerative colitis by increasing inflammation. Or if they get into your small intestine, they can promote Crohn's disease. Uh, this is simply exposure uh, combined with the um, immune function in these uh, tissues. Uh, so decreasing the amount of this oral bacteria bacteria that goes through your gut is highly beneficial in preventing them from overgrowing elsewhere uh, because if it doesn't overwhelm the stomach's ability um, to kill these bacteria, then they won't have a way of causing problems further down the road. Looking at oral health may also identify sensitivities to foods. Uh, if you're having a, a sensitivity to acidic foods in your mouth, there's a, a chance that this may cause problems in your esophagus as well as in your stomach. So we want to identify these sensitivities, especially if we're going to enter a, um, uh, an elimination diet. That's, uh, that's a key thing to look for um, as one of your symptoms. Oral health is also a general marker of systemic inflammation, inflammatory diseases such as cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, yada, 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 um, are uh, marked by systemic inflammation. And some of this can come from the mouth. Uh, and additionally, there may be some uh, way that systemic inflammation actually promotes gingivitis by just having a, a generally inflammatory milieu and shifting the immune system to um, kind of be less protective than it could be. And finally, uh, as mentioned in the previous slide, uh, oral health can be a potential marker of meal structure. Uh, if you're snacking all day, if you're not eating very well, uh, this can kind of give you a, a pretty good idea that you need to change your diet. The lower esophagus and stomach. Now, um, the, the esophagus is simply a pipe moving from the mouth to the stomach. So we broke it up between upper and lower esophagus because generally problems in the esophagus are going to be a direct result of something going on with its neighbor. So with the upper esophagus, um, uh, generally it's gonna be problems with oral health kind of creeping in there. But with the lower esophagus, it's going to be problems with the stomach um, causing problems with the upper esophagus. So things like esophagitis, um, uh, GERD, gastrointestinal reflux disease. Um, now this, it's interesting, new data indicates that it might not just be um, stomach acid creeping up into the lower esophagus. It can also be uh, bile uh, flowing back from the uh, duodenum into the stomach as well. Um, stomach ulcers are another problem you want to be on the look for. Uh, early indigestion, what I mean by that is within the first 30 to 60 minutes of eating indigestion. It, it's perfectly normal to burp a little bit when you either drink or eat because you're swallowing some air. But here we're talking about, you know, m you know not simply minor burps. Uh, we're talking about major indigestion, kind of this feeling um, within your stomach of excessive gas, kind of forcing burps to come out early uh, on in the feeding process. Overgrowth of H. pylori, this is um, almost certainly caused by a multitude of factors, increased inflammation, problems with the mucus layer in the stomach, uh, stress is involved as well, which is pro you know, probably working its way through the gut brain axis. Um, so having an overgrowth of H. pylori, which you wouldn't necessarily feel, but you may have uh, gone to a doctor and they may have done a test and found that H. pylori is a problem for you. H. pylori is in a lot of people. Um, it only causes problems when um, mucosal defense system in the stomach doesn't keep it at bay. Functional dyspepsia. Uh, here we're moving beyond a simple early indigestion to um, a prolonged feeling of fullness in the stomach, meaning you eat and then you just feel super full uh, for a prolonged period of time, or in addition, pain in the stomach area as well. Um, again, this is probably going to be something uh, you're diagnosed with. You may have it. A lot of it goes undiagnosed. People think, think it's simply just indigestion, uh, but it, it's well beyond indigestion into this prolonged feeling of of heaviness in the stomach that just doesn't really go away. And finally, gastroparesis. Gastroparesis, uh, effectively, stomach paralysis, is delayed gastric emptying. Um, gastroparesis um, is interesting. The stomach actually plays a, a pretty big role in blood uh, glucose regulation uh, when blood glucose levels get too high. Um, uh, uh, gastric motility is delayed to kind of slow down uh, delivery of nutrients into the um, small intestine. So this can actually be a problem related to uh, type 2 diabetes and things of that nature. Um, so um, these are the things to generally look for with stomach. 
Why does stomach health matter? Um, stomach health is a major site of chemical and mechanical protein breakdown. So if it is not working properly, it is a bad situation. Uh, another problem is if you have permeability in the stomach, uh, again, since it's a major site of uh, protein breakdown, you're gonna have much larger proteins entering in your bloodstream. You absolutely do not want this. Uh, the stomach is uh, is effectively breaking down ginormous chunks of protein into smaller, more manageable uh, peptides, which are s smaller lengths of proteins that can be broken down more effectively in the duodenum. So if the uh, if your stomach acid isn't working properly, if it's excessive and it's damaging the stomach wall, this is a major problem that needs to be addressed. Um, stomach's also a major microbial kill site. Uh, the hydrochloric acid in the stomach should do a good job of breaking down any bacteria that comes through. Not to say that you want to uh, ram down a ton of bacteria into your stomach, but uh, it kind of gives you a backup plan for if, you know, uh, say you're on vacation and you don't get access to brushing your teeth. If you have a healthy stomach, that shouldn't be a major deal. But if you're continually not brushing your teeth, continually exposing the stomach to tons of um, uh, oral bacteria, that may not necessarily be a good idea. Properly functioning stomach should prevent that um, prevent that oral bacteria from making it past the stomach, uh, which is interesting if you think about it. I mentioned earlier about how uh, there is um, uh, there's excessive oral bacteria in um, in uh, IBD, um, so it's clearly making it through the stomach so in addition to looking at oral health uh, we have to look at stomach health uh, and these aren't even uh, manifestations within uh, the stomach or the mouth these are manifesting within a small intestine or large intestine just brings you back to how important the progressive nature of the digestive tract is and as i mentioned previously it participates in blood glucose regulation reasoning behind this if you have high glucose you're more likely to have functional dyspepsia um and just uh and gastroparesis as well. Um, correcting blood glucose can uh, improve gastric motility, which would decrease your feeling of fullness and pain in the uh, epigastric region. Moving along to the small intestine, we have a number of problems that can creep up here. Uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, uh, which is an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine. Now this could simply be normal commensal healthy bacteria within the small intestine that simply overgrow. Uh, the uh, small intestine is an area where there should not be a high number of bacteria, even if they are beneficial. Um, it can also be further down. It can be in the ileum, uh, say the uh, ileocecal valve, which separates the small intestine from colon isn't working very well. Then we can get an overgrowth of bacteria that occurs in the large intestine into the small intestine. And what's really interesting with uh, something like SIBO is uh, it's actually a, an issue with motility. And when the motility of the small intestine more resembles the colon, uh, the bacteria within the small intestine, both in numbers and uh, in the makeup of those bacteria, tend to resemble the colon uh, bacterial microenvironment as well. Uh, duodenal ulcer, again, this is something you would have been diagnosed with more than likely. Um, delayed indigestion, so we're talking about, you know, uh, 60 to 60 minutes to two hours after a meal, suddenly getting all of these burps. Um, made, again, we're talking about major indigestion. We're not just top, talking about, you know, a burp here or there, you know, a couple hours into your meal. Um, we're talking about relatively major indigestion that's delayed simply because now the stomach is opening up into the duodenum and gas can escape from the small intestine in the stomach and make its way uh, out as a burp. Crohn's disease, again, something you're probably diagnosed with. You may have it and uh, you haven't been diagnosed. Again, most of these problems, a lot of people think, oh, I just have indigestion and they're not going to the doctor to get checked up, which is bad. Celiac disease, the same. If you have it, or if you know you have it, you've been diagnosed with it, you're not kind of guessing. Don't guess on something like that, um, especially with celiac disease because we know the trigger um, and uh, you know eliminating gluten is a, a very effective way to preventing that, uh, at least the symptomology. Bowel and obstruction, um, again, this is just a blockage, um, probably related to either some problem in motility or a specific area within the small intestine that has been damaged. So uh, it's either in a chronically contracted state or it simply does not relax. Uh, this can present it as, a, as an obstruction or you could have an actual obstruction. 
Finally, IBS, uh, you know, multiple types. There's IBSD as in diarrhea, IBSC as in constipation, and IBSM as in mixed. Um, a lot of this ca can be related to things going on in the small intestine, but in general, IBS is a, a colon, a, a problem within the colon. Um, uh, but uh, there can be, as as with IBD, um, uh, where we see, which is you know, Crohn's disease is the manifestation in the small intestine. Um, we can see problems going up further in the the digestive tract contributing to these problems. Why does small intestine health matter? Well, the small intestine is the primary site of nutrient absorption. So if you think about that, um, if it's not working properly, uh, you could a um, you could a not be absorbing all the nutrients from your food, which could be inducing uh, nutrient deficiencies. Um, primarily micronutrient deficiencies, but you could also have issues um, with not getting enough calories in. Uh, the small intestine is also exposed to bile acids. These, uh, these things are secreted by us to help emulsify fats and break them down, uh, but they will damage uh, the cells of your small intestine if they are exposed to them. Um, unless, uh, you know, ideally, they make it all the way to the ileum where we have receptors to recycle them. Uh, small, again, the small intestine should have a low bacterial load. It is not like the colon. Um, it's, um, it's supposed to be very low in bacterial numbers because it's exposed to all these enzymes and bile acids that keep, um, that keep bacterial numbers low. Um, the, um, the small intestine is also not as uh, protected as the colon. Uh, the colon has two mucus layers uh, within it, and um, one of them is very dense, tightly packed, and attached to the intestinal wall. Uh, this prevents bacteria from getting uh, exposing itself to the intestinal wall, which uh, decreases immune response, makes uh, gives the gut a, a, a chance to um, identify things that should be there and that shouldn't be there. It promotes immune tolerance and can help eliminate pathogens before they come into contact um, with uh, the intestinal wall. Um, so motility and mucus protection are key factors in the small intestine. If you have a small intestine disorder, there's a good chance you probably have a motility and mucus production problem. Uh, the reason for this is uh, mucus production is coming from the intestinal wall um, and it's pushing bacteria away from the intestinal wall and motility is kind of shuffling the bacteria out of the small intestine and towards the large intestine. So um, having both of these uh, are, are very protective factors for the small intestine and the disorders of both motility and mucus production are very problematic for the small intestine. Now we can take a look at the final portion of the digestive tract, uh, that is the large intestine, also known as the colon. And there are a number of uh, problems we can see here, um, diarrhea, constipation, and other stool abnormalities, electrolyte and water imbalance, diverticulitis and diverticulosis, polyps, IBS, ulcerative colitis, and adhesions and or obstructions. Now, when we take a look at what the colon does, we get a pretty good idea of why colon health matters and uh, why it is crucial uh, for having a healthy gut and overall health. The large intestine is the major site of stool formation. First of all, we have the leftover products from our food making their way in there, things that are undigestible and or unabsorbable that are forming bulk, feeding uh, microbes within the colon. And therefore, the large intestine is the major site of stool formation. And we're not just dealing with, you know, the leftovers from what we ate. Uh, the colon is actually also really important for the absorption, which is taking water from inside the colon and absorbing into the body and secretion, which is the opposite direction, taking water from the body and dumping it in the colon, uh, as well as um, electrolytes. So it can play a pretty critical role in our electrolyte balance. And as a result of the the uh, active uh, secretion and absorption of water, it plays a really important role in our stool consistency. Also, um, it plays an important role in our stool color, which is going to have to do with our next uh, important part of the colon, which is the high bacterial load. It's where the vast majority of our microbiome is. Therefore, we can see gas and bloating and things of that nature. Um, we, 
particularly if we see uh, uh, dysbiosis or overgrowth of specific types of bacteria. Uh, however, we can also see um, when we have a messed up colon, it can eventually lead to um, bacterial translocation, uh, which is the movement of bacteria from the large intestine into the bloodstream. And, and this can cause problems. It can cause systemic inflammation. It can negatively impact the liver because that's the first place that um, bacteria and bacterial byproducts are gonna go for detoxification. And finally, we have various site-specific conditions that change throughout the colon. As you can see in this image, we have the, um, uh, the beginning part, the cecum right here, which is immediately attached to the small intestine, um, the ascending colon, which moves up, the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, which when you kind of get trapped gas, this is one of the areas where that happens. And um, we have the also the appendix and the rectum, which we're going to discuss in a moment. But these are diverse in the type of bacteria they house. They're uh, basically because we have different levels of oxygen, different levels of metabolites, and different pH all the way throughout. So we're going to see a very uh, different um, microbiome signatures throughout these uh, three primary areas uh, and the, the sigmoid colon. Uh, for one, uh, generally speaking, the cecum right here is generally more acidic because we have bacteria fermenting the fiber, creating short chain fatty acids. And then we get down over here to the descending colon. We're going to, um, it's, we're going to have a, a little uh, more alkaline environment. Uh, we're going to see fermentation uh, of amino acids over here, and that's going to create ammonia. Uh, so the, while it is one long tube, it is drastically different in each of these uh, four areas. Uh, finally, which we're going to kind of include this as part of the digestive tract, is uh, we're talking about the appendix and rectum, which are effectively offshoots of the colon. They are parts of the colon, uh, but we want to look at these uh, a little differently. Um, their functions are um, warrant that we do this. Um, they're both offshoots of the colon, and uh, problems in the appendix or the rectum uh, may indicate problems within the colon. Um, the appendix this data seems to indicate that the appendix may seed the colonic microbiome. In other words, uh, it may house some bacteria that functions as a blueprint for the microbiome uh, in the uh, cecum uh, and beyond. Um, when we have motility problems in the colon or we have problems uh, with like a dry hard stool, we can get a rectal prolapse, which is kind of like you know the rectum turning inside out, um, and fissures, which are tear in, tears in the lining of the rectum. So we may see um, appendicitis or these uh, rectal prolapse and fissures in these two specific areas. Um, and these are actually indicative of a problem uh, within the entire colon, more than likely. Here we have our accessory digestive organs, which play a role in helping break down our food. Um, problems we can see with the accessory digestive organs, here starting with the liver, uh, we have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which effectively means inflammation of the liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is what comes after uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. We can include the alcohol versions of these, so if you drink too much alcohol, uh, you're effectively getting the exact same problem. It's just uh, different causal pathways, um, generally speaking, overconsumption of calories and potentially fructose drive non-alcoholic fatty liver disease disease, whereas alcoholic fatty liver disease or cirrhosis um, is caused by alcohol. Um, we also have cholestasis, um, the, um, which is uh, bile flow being obstructed, uh, going from the liver into the duodenum. Next, we have the gallbladder. The gallbladder uh, holds bile and secretes it into this um, uh, bile duct as well. Um, we can get an obstruction, which will back up, um, and some people have had their gallbladder removed. Here we have the pancreas, uh, which serves a role in digestion as well as playing a role in regulating our blood glucose level. With the pancreas, we can get pancreatitis, which is uh, inflammation of the pancreas. And since it does join down here into a common bile duct, um, we can see uh, cholestasis as well. Finally, what's kind of interesting about this whole thing is that pale stool can be a potential indicator of a problem with um, uh, this bile duct um, or bile in general. Bile gives both our stool and our urine its colorful appearance, uh, yellow with urine and uh, brown with stool. And that is due to bile um, when it makes its way into, um, uh, into the deeper parts of the small intestine and into the colon. Um, our microbiome biotransforms the bile pigments to give our um, 
to give our urine its yellow color, depending on if it gets absorbed into the bloodstream, or our stool its brown color if it makes its way into the colon. Why are the accessory digestive organs important? Uh, well, first we have the liver. Uh, the liver plays a really important role uh, in the emulsification of fats. It is what makes bile. It synthesizes the bile. Um, and uh, it also, there is an, something called the enterohepatic circulation. The liver stores nutrients and dumps it into the digestive tract. Um, and then the, uh, the nutrients make their way. Uh, things like vitamin K, various vitamins and, and things of that nature make their way through the digestive tract. Uh, they might get reabsorbed and sent back to the liver. This is what is called the enterohepatic circulation. Entero meaning gut, hepatic meaning liver. Um, the gallbladder is important because it actually stores high amounts of um, bile so that when we eat a, a fatty meal, it kind of uh, contracts and dumps its uh, bile into uh, the duodenum to help uh, break down fats, make them smaller so uh, that we can absorb them. Uh, interestingly, uh, a lot of people may have had their gallbladders removed and when our gallbladder has been removed, uh, our liver basically just dumps um, uh, bile into the um, duodenum through the bile ducts. Uh, just it's, you're not going to get as big of a uh, an immediate effect, but uh, bile actually undergoes he he um, enterohepatic circulation. So it enters the duodenum, goes through, helps most of my fats, and then when it gets down towards the ileum, it gets reabsorbed and sent back to the liver, so we can use it again. So you, you um, while you may not be able to dump large amounts at any time, you can continuously circulate it. 95% of our bile acids are reabsorbed. 5% enter the colon where they're acted upon by our um, microbiome that gives our stool our color and also generates um, uh, different secondary bile acids that function as um, signaling molecules not only in the gut but throughout the body. Finally, the pancreas. Uh, the pancreas does a lot. It secretes bicarbonate, which actually helps um, uh, helps protect the duodenum. Um, the duodenum is hooked up to the stomach. The stomach dumps all the acidic contents in here. The bicarbonate secreted by the pancreas helps neutralize the pH. Uh, the um, pancreas also has uh, digestive enzymes, um, proteases that break down proteins, uh, lipases that break down um, fats and uh, amylase and other uh, carbohydrate digesting enzymes, which help further break down our food so that brush border enzymes can break them down into their smallest units so that we can absorb them into our bloodstream. Many people erroneously just kind of look at symptomology that's coming from the gut and problems that they're coming, uh, they have coming from the gut in terms of addressing gut problems. But there are also systemic problems that you're going to need to address if your goal is to have a healthy gut. For example, obesity, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and type 2 diabetes are disorders that are generally going to dramatically increase your risk for gut health problems. And simply uh, being on the pathway to any of these conditions is going to disturb your digestive tract. Um, primarily, this is caused by immunometabolic problems, um, the immune system, increased inflammation, metabolic problems, uh, things like hyperglycemia, hypertriglyceridemia, um, lipid abnormalities, um, things of that nature. Um, strictly speaking, the uh, metabolism is the, is the language every cell in your body uh, uses to communicate. So when you have problems uh, with uh, metabolic markers such as uh, blood glucose and, and triglycerides, you're going to have problems with um, with all of your organs and tissues interacting properly with one another. But we do have some um, some data on how specifically these things do affect the gut. For example, a chronic uh, hyperglycemia uh, leads to enteric neuropathy and intestinal permeability. Interestingly enough, insulin corrects this, so it's not necessarily having high blood glucose levels. It's having high blood glucose levels with inadequate insulin or inadequate insulin signaling. So, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of focus on uh, post-meal blood uh, glucose spikes. That, that's probably nothing you really need to concern yourself with uh, in respect to how it might negatively affect the gut. 
gut simply because if you have proper insulin sig signaling and adequate insulin, you're not really going to cause these problems. Also, um, this leads to um, dysfunction in any one of the gut uh, slash organ axis axes. So uh, many people know of the gut brain axis, but there are other axes. There's the gut muscle, the gut bone, the gut adipose tissue. There are um, several um, connections between the gut and other organs and tissues. And the problem is when you have immunometabolic problems, you're going to see these, uh, these axes disrupted. And of course, as we just mentioned, uh, the, the um, gut brain axis, you want to focus on mood and anxiety disorders, and you definitely want to uh, work on developing a healthy relationship with food. A lot of people, uh, especially people with gut problems, have uh, certain foods they don't tolerate very well, um, and they have kind of this odd relationship with food where food is a stressful event for them. And if every time you eat, you get stressed out, you're certainly going to have problems with your uh, digestion. And finally, autoimmune conditions and inflammatory disorders. These are generally going to come with high levels of systemic inflammation, and this can cause problems. This can increase intestinal permeability, and it can negatively impact the digestive tract. So there are a number of tests we can look at. The first category of tests that we want to look at are tests that um, are general tests that you'll normally see on like a comprehensive metabolic panel that you get with your annual physical. Things like thyroid tests, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, T4, T3, reverse T3, and uh, TPO antibodies. This will give us an idea of how the thyroid's functioning. The thyroid helps regulate our metabolism. So when we have problems with our thyroid, this can impact how our gut works. Liver enzymes, AST, ALT, ALP, which is alkaline phosphatase, and GGT. Uh, these can give us an idea if the liver is working well. As we mentioned earlier, the liver is really important for digestive tract function. It has that enterohepatic circulation. Uh, so we want to make sure our liver is functioning properly. Uh, the lipid panel, particularly uh, HDL, um, which is often known as the good cholesterol, but there's not really good or bad cholesterol per se. Um, but the interesting thing with HDL uh, is recent evidence has indicated that HDL may be um, a way that the gut helps deal with endotoxemia. In other words, the translocation of um, bacteria from the gut into the blood. So HDL may be protective um, with that. Uh, triglycerides, high triglycerides. Glycerides are generally going to be a marker of poor metabolic function, um, and the HDL to triglyceride ratio can be used as a marker of insulin sensitivity, but we also have other markers. Uh, the glucose markers that we generally uh, look at are oral glucose tolerance test, which is how your body deals with a 75 gram load of uh, glucose. Hemoglobin A1C um, is another pretty good um, uh, blood glucose measure. It's a three-month measure of your blood glucose levels. Fasting insulin is also an uh, interesting one, uh, you know, and you have to look at it in context. Um, low uh, ins fasting insulin in a healthy person is probably good. Low fasting insulin in a long time type 2 diabetic is probably bad. That's probably indicative uh, less of insulin sensitivity uh, as well as um, uh, less of insulin sensitivity and more that your um, your pancreas isn't functioning properly. And finally, inflammatory markers, uh, uh, high sensitive C-reactive protein and glycate are pretty good markers of systemic inflammation. We want to know what those levels are. Um, and interestingly, um, most of these uh, last three, the lipid panel, uh, the glucose measures and the inflammatory markers uh, are on a new uh, test called a precision health report test, which assesses your cardiometabolic health. Very interesting test. I've had it done. Um, I had very good results. I'm very psyched about that. Uh, but you may want to look into also getting that precision health report to see uh, what your cardiometabolic risk is. Now we can delve into more gut-specific uh, testing. Uh, interestingly, there's a, there's a cool little test that put out by Zoe, who has a um, who has an app. Uh, to help assess uh, gut health and individual response to diet. And um, they have a blue poop test. Basically, you just create these muffins with a specific type of blue food dye. You consume them and you see how long it takes for your poop to turn blue or green. This can give you an idea of how quickly things are moving through your gastrointestinal tract, which can give you a pretty good idea of 
some of the microbes you have living there. A five sugar intestinal permeability assay. Uh, this is very interesting. There's five different sugars. Um, you consume them and based on how they're digested and absorbed in the, in the gut, you can get an idea of where specifically you may have permeability issues. We will cover that test uh, in a future video. Microbiome analysis with clinical markers. A lot of the old like Ubiome only gave you um, the microbiome analysis, but the, the newer ones are much better. They give you clinical markers, which are also helpful on top of the uh, members of your microbiome. Uh, they give you markers such as short chain fatty acids, calprotectin, um, bile acids, uh, antimicrobial peptides, and uh, mucus in stool. Uh, they can also assess for parasites, uh, sulfate reducing bacteria, which can kind of give you an idea of uh, whether or not you should be eating a high animal protein diet or not and yeast as well and finally obviously the colonoscopy is a regular test that people begin getting in their 50s which can you know give an give an idea of um, the healthiness uh, of specifically the colon Using your data, it's really important to uh, determine how you're going to use your data. Uh, if you're going at it alone, it's really good to, to um, have data so that you can see how your changes at, uh, impact uh, both your gut-specific health and your um, overall systemic health uh, from time to time. See how certain things you do change it. Also, if you are going to eventually see a practitioner and you have a gastrointestinal disorder, uh, compiling your data is really important. It um, gives your uh, practitioner a, a much better uh, opportunity to zero in on potential problems so you know once you've compiled your um, you know the problems you've had uh, with your nine point GI scan where you've seen your um, where you've seen your gastrointestinal problems whether they stem from the oral health your stomach um, things of that nature having that readily available uh, for a practitioner is very useful and having it available to you so you can see how it changes over time when you make changes is also really useful you'll want to um, Put it into a spreadsheet is one thing many people do. I commonly use an Excel spreadsheet for stuff like this. Just very easy to, to kind of code things and to bring them back up. And you can also create, if you're dealing with numerical uh, test results, you can kind of make graphs and charts to see how you're going. This compiling all this data is is used to address your weak points. And a lot of people may not know they have weak points. They may not even understand that oral health is really important for overall gastrointestinal health. They may not realize that's a weak point. You can't address a weak point if you don't identify it first. Once you identify it, you certainly want to use that data to address uh, the weak points. You'll use this to tweak your behavior. You'll use this list for if you do an elimination diet to see if you have any symptoms come up. Also, there's a really interesting uh, app for uh, Apple and Android called the My Symptom app. Great app, works very well. I've had people use it and tell me that, you know, it gave them some insight into some of the foods they were eating and how it elicited some of their symptoms. So you may want to check that out as well. Uh, regardless, you're going to want to have data compiled uh, of the different areas of the gastrointestinal tract that are a problem for you and the symptoms that you should be on the lookout for. So now we get to the big part. Why do we want to address our lifestyle first? Well, the first reason, no side or negative effects. You're not going to have a major negative effect from improving your sleep or working on your physical activity. Uh, so you won't generally see the major problems people have when they try a supplement that may or may not work for them or enzymes. Uh, creating, you're creating the conditions that optimize digestive health. Um, our physiology was built uh, on the backbone of a very specific lifestyle that where, you know, we didn't have access to cheap, high energy foods. We were more physically active. We were more exposed to uh, proper lighting conditions. Stress was more acute rather than chronic and things of that nature. So we want to create these conditions that optimize our digestive health. Uh, that way, we're going to put our microbiome under the conditions it evolved under. The microbes that are in your gut have evolved with humans uh, for you know, thousands of years. So Currently, one of the um, one of the interesting hypotheses on why we are kind of seeing more chronic disease and poor health is that it's a mismatch between our genes and the environment. And so, if we put ourselves under the proper environmental conditions, we can optimize our physiology. These will create those conditions that optimize digestive health and put the microbiome under the same conditions that they can evolve under. So we can have a healthier microbiome to both help improve our digestive health, but also to improve our overall health. And finally, lifestyle is the frontline 
um, therapeutic approach to addressing the systemic factors that we mentioned, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, obesity, um, type 2 diabetes, and things of that nature. So when you uh, address your lifestyle, you will also be addressing the systemic factors that go wonky when you have a poor lifestyle, things like inflammation and metabolic dysfunction, high blood glucose, abnormal blood lipids, and things of that nature. So what are the primary uh, behavioral factors that we want to address up front for a healthy gut? We want to create a meal schedule and uh, we want to pick times and kind of stick to them. It's probably most important to pick a window. So, you know, you're going to have a feeding window from, let's say, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. or whatever. It's, it's different for everybody. You want to create this eat feeding window and then put your meals within that and make sure that you eat on time. This doesn't mean you have to eat it exactly, eat lunch at exactly noon every single day, but generally speaking, you want to be plus or minus 15 minutes from that time. You want to stick to those meal times, particularly your first and last meal, because those will be dictating your uh, feeding window. Also, if you're going to pick meals, three per day is good. The reason that I like doing three per day is actually twofold. For one, it gets you into, um, gets you into a pattern where you're going to feed and then you're going to have a period where you're not feeding which will allow you to digest your food um, it'll also give you the opportunity to brush your teeth so that you don't have uh, food stuck to your teeth and in your mouth where you can kind of have issues where you know your, your um, oral health may be taking a hit because you know you're getting overgrowth of different um, oral bacteria that you may be swallowing and these can kind of move further down the digestive tract slow down and chew particularly at the beginning of your meals your first few bites you know make 20 or 30 chew 20 to 30 chews chew them slowly this prepares the digestive tract um, it increases salivary output it's going to improve your digestive efficiency the amount of food you absorb and it's going to allow your um, your body to adjust and more properly regulate your blood glucose levels Schedule daily walks. This is another way that you can really improve your blood glucose levels. You can schedule walks immediately before or after meals. That way, if you do eat a higher carbohydrate diet, you won't get huge spikes. Again, ultimately, those post-meal spikes are not a huge issue compared to having poor blood glucose regulation and um, uh, poor insulin sensitivity. Those are much bigger issues. Scheduling walks will address all of those things, and, and um, you want to kind of look at your daily physical activity as mostly walking but you also want to add in exercise um, you want to address flexibility balance strength training and aerobic training these are really important things for our physiology it's going to be really important for you to main, uh, maintain bone mass um, uh, muscle mass or bone density muscle mass throughout your life cycle uh, improving flexibility and balance will also allow you to move more freely and with less pain and it will help you maintain vigor further on into uh, as you age you know starting an exercise program early on is really important the things you do in your 30s 40s and 50s will dictate how you feel in your 60s 70s and 80s and exercise is really important for that develop a sleep hygiene protocol um, that can be first setting your bed and wake times and sticking to those staying consistent is crucial for developing good sleep patterns getting uh, your light exposure right is important as well being physically active during the day is important as well not eating right before bed sometimes you can add in different things like a you know a hot shower at night which will eventually cool your body so that you get down to sleep a little better blocking blue light at night just develop an overall sleep hygiene protocol in particular you want to make sure you're avoiding stressful things whether they're books um, family members or movies on the television just kind of calm down as the night goes on that way when it's time to go to bed you go to bed and finally get outside highly underrated really important probably plays a very important it certainly plays an important role in setting your circadian rhythm uh, there's tons of data on being outside uh, in the woods such as forest bathing having beneficial effects on stress um, various other markers and kind of getting out there is uh, just very good for your overall health getting fresh air and generally speaking if you're at a park you're not just sitting down you're doing things and uh, you can be with your family and just take some time to chill out from the grind 
And finally, you're going to want to assess your progress. This is really important and no one ever does this. I mean, for the most part, people don't address lifestyle first in the first place, but you really should assess your progress. You want to make slow changes and assess what you can when you can. Uh, one of the things we do with the Healthy Lifestyle Program is we give you a couple of things to do per week. You implement them uh, for the week, see how they affect you, and then you move on to the next stage. This is really important in forming a progressive, uh, a progressive approach to addressing your lifestyle. Uh, it's those tiny steps over a period of time that lead to major change. Most people don't do well with rapid change and they don't assess things. They don't see how they feel. They don't see how uh, what they're doing is beneficial to their health. They don't see how it changes their health. So when they fall back into their old patterns, they don't even realize that you know what, they're do what they were doing before was leading to a measurable improvement in them create blocks for retesting. You can retest a lot of things and there are things you can test weekly, daily, and then there are things you should test uh, over the months to years. So for example, if you use an activity tracker, you can look at how your sleep changes um, daily. There is clearly some uh, hiccups with some of these um, with some of these devices, but we're talking about things like Fitbit, Aura Ring. You can see how it impacts your readiness score. You can see how your heart rate changes, your resting heart rate. You, if, if you are not exercising, if you are not really kind of addressing your stress and you start doing that, um, you will see that change on an activity tracker and you'll see some early uh, results but you're also going to have other testing something you might do uh, on the monthly you might do an oral glucose tolerance test or fasting glucose this is something you can do from home you can test your blood pressure if you like um, and then of course there's going to be things that you do more more quarterly you might uh, get an at-home hemoglobin a1c test um, and then of course you're going to have your uh, annual or semi-annual uh, comprehensive metabolic panel, which will give you a read on uh, how systemic health is doing. And then you can choose to do the microbiome tests when you like. Um, the problem, they are fairly expensive, so it's not something that you're going to do as often as you know a comprehensive metabolic panel, which is covered by your insurance. You definitely want to include subjective feelings. How you feel? How are these changes making you feel? Do you feel better? Do you feel more optimistic? Are you breaking a, an unhealthy relationship with food by doing these things? Do they make you feel good? Uh, are they calming you down? And uh, you'll want to establish a full routine for four to eight weeks before moving forward. So what do we mean by that? So you're going to be changing things and most people are not going to change everything all at once. So they'll, as we mentioned with our healthy lifestyle program, we make a few changes um, per week over the course of you know, uh, four weeks. And then we have some pretty big changes. Uh, we found the things that work for us. We've dumped the things that don't work for us. Now we want to maintain that baseline. This is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be eating on this meal schedule. We're going to be sleeping on this schedule. We're going to be doing this physical activity at this time, this many times a week, et cetera, et cetera. So now you just have what your everyday routine is. Then we can establish that for four to eight weeks and test. If you like, you can do microbiome testing to see how that's changed, or you can just do it to get a, a baseline. And then we can move forward with an elimination diet or going to see a practitioner to get some further testing to form a baseline. Or if we already have baseline data, we can go take, um, take our comprehensive metabolic panel and see how these things have changed, um, changed our overall health and our gut health. In summary, uh, the first and most critical step for improving or optimizing your gut health is doing a GI scan, identify your weak links, identify symptoms that may be popping up in certain areas, for example, uh, aphthous ulcers in, in the oral cavity or uh, thrush, things of that nature, cavities, maybe you have delayed gastric emptying, identify your weak links so you can have things to focus on to improve, as well as things to look for uh, when you make changes. You know, perhaps uh, as you make changes, you you're, you feel less full after meals, that's indicating that your stomach's working better and a very good sign. Step two is to identify systemic problems that you need to address, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, type two diabetes, obesity, things of that nature, um, increased inflammatory markers. These things are really important for our cells to communicate with one another, uh, both within an organ and between organs. So in order for um, you know, your a, a singular organ to work properly, you definitely do not want to have you know, chronic systemic inflammation or chronic hyperglycemia. But if you want your organ systems to work together, it's even more critically important because these organs are communicating through metabolism and um, inflammatory markers can mess this up.
There are many useful markers from a comprehensive metabolic panel to look at from your thyroid panel or liver enzymes, blood glucose levels, inflammatory markers, et cetera, et cetera. Direct gut testing is also useful. Um, generally speaking, if you're not trying to waste money, I would wait until you do the behavior change first and then use that as a baseline. Some people like to do the testing more um, and don't really care about the cost. And if you really need to get buy-in, it's probably best to do a, um, a, a form of gut testing, whether it's an intestinal permeability assay or a microbiome uh, test with clinical markers first, make the change and then see how those change uh, moving forward. Behavioral change should uh, proceed therapeutic approaches. Uh, you're going to get most of the movement and the improvements in your digestive health, health by behavior change. So you should address that first, and then you can tackle the therapeutic approaches afterwards. These are really not going to make huge leaps or improvements, but um, they will be more effective if you've led with behavior change and improved your lifestyle. And finally, most important thing, create healthy habits that stick. It doesn't matter if you make some change now and then you go back to the way you were. These are habits that need to stick. These are things that need to work for you and your lifestyle and you know the various things that affect what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So find out the things that work for you, stick with them, get rid of the things that really don't help, and then move forward from there. You may want to try an elimination diet or you may want to see a practitioner to help uh, address uh, some of these individual components that you've identified in step one and the systemic problems that you find in steps two and three. Thank you all for listening into this presentation. I hope it served you well. If you like it and want to see more like it, like and share on YouTube, like and share on social media. If you have any questions or comments or things uh, that are constructive in criticism, please feel free to drop those as well. We, this is the reference section. Uh, we will put this w within the description so that you can access it um, and we'll add some other things from time to time. There will be a companion blog that you may want to check out. We'll put the link to that in the description as well. Thank you very much. Take care.